set of phenomena that happened in the first century that might repeat themselves in the second century because the Bible has the duality in prophecy, as you know. Uh, last time we began about the basics of Gnosticism. Uh, I just wanted you to be informed that, you know, Gnostics are the ones, brethren, that it's the philosophy, it's a religious system, even present to this day, under that name Gnosticism. But the various uh, faculties of Gnosticism have crept in to various other churches and various other uh, religious systems. Gnosticism originally was the idea, the ideology that subverted the original church. Now why was that? Well, the teachings of Gnosticism seem to be so biblical, they seem to be so like the truth, but they were not really. And uh, and anyhow, uh, people, many people fell for it. In fact, you can barely understand some of the, you can perhaps not even understand, various passages in the Old, in the New Testament, that is, unless you understand something about Gnosticism, because, brethren, the New Testament church, the original church, had to face Gnosticism and fight against it. At first, it was very successful. You had a refutal of Gnosticism in various, in various epistles, Colossians being Colossians being one of the most most uh, explicit against it. So the early church, the apostolic church, had to fight against it. At first, it was very successful, but as the apostles died, uh, as the apostles died, uh, the Gnosticism was advancing very quickly, and Gnostics, Gnostics prevailed within the visible, organized church and kicked out the uh, few remaining faithful believers. That's why in the third epistle of John we read about, we read about the, uh, about the uh, Diotrephes who is actually not receiving the, uh, those sent by the apostles, the, uh, the, the evangelists who are traveling around. And, uh, not only that, but uh, he didn't receive them, but he was also kicking out those who would receive such such people, you know. Those uh, visiting evangelists, traveling evangelists, who were with the same sole purpose of spreading the good news. That's how we understand what was going on, and we understand, for example, I told you already, later in the Bible we hear nothing about uh, Timothy, for example, and Timothy... Timothy, you know, was a faithful member of the church, but Timothy did not prevail against those Gnostics and was kicked out with few, 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 few believers and so on. That's why you notice, perhaps, uh, in the Epistle of John, the Epistles of John just constantly remind us of what was at the beginning. The beginning was, you know, the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, and He came in the flesh. Remember, John's Gospel, how it starts, He came but into the flesh, and he came among us, he was God among us, Emmanuel, and then, however, the darkness did not, could not stand him, so the darkness killed him, and nevertheless, he rose after, that's how Gospels John begins. Then in his letters, we, we have, we have this uh, refuta refutation of Gnostics, brethren, because he says, at one point, those who do not believe that Christ came in the flesh, they have no father, they have no son. They are not believers. Those who believe that he came in the flesh, yes, they have both both father and son. Mind you, he doesn't mention the Holy Spirit as being a trinity. So, uh, so the thing is that uh, Gnosticism is a very serious thing. You might hear that the New Age religion today, New Age movement, is kind of Gnostic, and it is. But many Gnostic ideas have remained in nominal Christianity because the original church was subverted. The remnant of the original church, the true church, in the second century through Polycarp, later Polycrats, uh, continued to, to exist and uh, preach the gospel. But in the nominal Christianity, the nominal church, the one which in few hours now will be celebrating its Christmas midnight mass, that church, brethren, retained so many of the Gnostic 
Gnostic beliefs. So that's why you find Gnosticism all over the place, including the nominal Christianity. In fact, uh, the father of Gnosticism, as far as history is concerned, the father of Gnosticism is Simon Magus. You know, brethren, Simon Magus. The one who we find in the very early stage of the true church, right there in Acts chapter 8. So, uh, we have to keep in mind that that's part also, the, 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 the attack by Gnostics is part of our history. It was part in the early century, in the first century, that was the part of the history of the true church. It continued, you can see that various Gnostic teachings also were present in, in Christ's uh, message to the, to the seven churches of, 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 of Revelation. You know. There were those Nicolaitans, there were those Balamites, brethren. What do you think that they, that they practiced? Well, of course they practiced Gnosticism. What else could they have practiced anyway? Uh, but the first encounter, you find it right there in the book of Acts chapter 8. So the Gnostics continued, and uh, one of those Gnostics was, in the third John, was Diotrephes anyway. But speaking before we... Uh, see and read that in third john uh, i just want to remind you again that gnosticism is samaritan it's not jewish because there are various scholars who endeavor to prove that gnosticism is jewish but no brethren it is not hegesippus tells us that james the just preached jesus to seven so-called jewish sects and uh, then uh, justin martyr in his first apology to rome uh, he wrote it at Rome in 150 AD. Justin the Martyr was Samaritan by birth. He informs us even earlier that Hegesippus that uh, the devil put forward certain men after Christ ascended to heaven. And those certain men, you know, said that they themselves were gods. And they were not only persecuted by the early church, but even deemed worthy of honors. And uh, since Justin the Martyr was a Samaritan, of course, he labeled the Samaritan uh, leader of Gnosticism. And he says there was a Samaritan Simon, a native of a certain village in Samaria. And then when Claudius reigned in Rome, in the royal city of Rome, he did mighty acts of magic. And by virtue of the art of the devils operating in him, he con was considered a god. And as a god was honored by you with a statue by you Romans. That's what Justin the Martyr means. Which statue was erected on the river Tiber between the two bridges and bore this inscription in the language of Rome. Simone Dei Sancto or to Simon the Holy God. You see brethren. So this is the, uh, <coughs> this is the fact that we see uh, from this historical context of Justin. It shows to us that he deems Simon the Sorcerer to be the first Gnostic. And uh, he mentions a few other names, but Justin mentions this Gnostic first, you see. And uh, Irenaeus was another Catholic authority. I'm not sure if I mentioned him already. He spoke about the origins of, of Gnosticism. He wrote a work against heresies. And he ascribed the oldest Gnostic system exactly to Simon Magus of Samaria, who is obviously uh, a follower would be this Diotrephus in the third book of John. Uh, the Jewish Orthodox, there is a Jewish Orthodox Gnosis itself, because I told you Gnosticism has penetrated, penetrated basically into all world religions. And the Jewish Orthodox Gnosis, or knowledge of itself, just cannot lead to something basically different from itself. And somebody must have taken it and made it into something new, turn it upside down, uh, uh, says Hegesippus and other uh, scholars, one of them being Jonas. And he says, who turned upside down the, uh, you know, that, that kind of gnosis, the Jewish gnosis, where Jonas shows that the Jews would hardly have attacked their own tradition, you see. Their own people, their own religion, so they certainly would not be the ones who say, look, oh, we gave birth to Gnosticism. So anyway, fiercely as... Gnosticism attacked the Jewish people, the Jewish tradition, and everything Jewish. 
this Jonas tells us that it was might be Simon the magician from Samaria who as is as it happens the earliest of all of the Gnostics anyway and then Hans Jonas is his name in one of his works he warns us that we must not forget that Simon Magus was the member of a very specially placed community, a group discriminated against, rejected, despised, meaning the Samaritans. Here we have a palpable motive for a response of resentment, aggression and spite, and here for once we can connect a definite meaning with much invoked hazy term fringes or outskirts of Judaism, at which we are told Gnosticism originated, a term that usually prompts me to ask, inside or outside of the line. The Samaritans were partly in and partly out, and some of them apparently very far out, says this Hans Jonas. And uh, he mentioned this fringe Judaism, that's a very vague term, but it's a term used by some scholars brethren to describe the origin of Gnosticism. A uh, fringe of Judaism was really Samaria, because Samaritan people were despised, as you know. Uh, even Jesus Christ mentions them in a very derogative term in the New Testament, they were despised, but they were constantly trying to falsify themselves and make them God's people. Make them the people of God, not the Jews, and so on. That's why you have this only in John's Gospel. You see, John, brethren, why, you may wonder, why do we find some things in John's Gospel that we don't find in other Gospels? Well, you see, John lived until the end of the first century. He was released from Patmos, and in some even historical uh, records. Some historical records even say that he lived until 108 AD, whether that's true or not. But he certainly lived towards the end of the first century. By the time that he was at the end of his life, living in Ephesus, he witnessed already how much the Gnostic conspiracy against the truth, how much roots it had taken within the church, and because of people like these Diotrephes, you know, that that that, that uh, he wrote to, we can see that uh, he, John, endeavored to strengthen those few faithful who remained and encourage them to endure to the end, you see. That's why only in his gospel we find what? We find that, you might remember, the account of Jesus at the well with Samaritan woman. Now, why did John, why did he pay so much attention to Samaria? Well, because that Samaritan woman finally realized who she was talking to. In fact, the entire town of Samaritans realized then that he was the Messiah, it was Jesus Christ, you see. Now, there are some other, let's say, theories, I won't call them speculations because I haven't checked them yet thoroughly, but there's some uh, theories that the woman he talked to was one of those five husbands that she had was actually uh, Simon Magus. But again, that's just a theory. It's a possibility. There is a work speaking about that. Somebody researched that. Uh, but I wouldn't be surprised. The reason why John was trying to show to all the Samaritans and others that a whole Samaritan town believed in the true Messiah whose origin was not Samaritan, he was a Jew, <laughs> by ethnic origin. That's why you find that account only in the Gospel of John, because all the other accounts were written a month before, all the other Gospel accounts. And then John was now writing at the end of the first century. That's why, again, in his epistle we find this call for love, true love, yes, true love between the brethren, but also he keeps saying them, Remember the beginning. Remember from the beginning. You remember what we taught you from the beginning. You, he, Those who listen to us, they are of God. Those who do not listen to us, they are Antichrist. Have just, many of them have gone out of the true church. And many of them are now in the world. That's why his style of writing does differ from other parts of the scripture. Because unlike the other apostles who died by the well, well before the end of the first century, the Apostle John had that <laughs> uh, unpleasant duty to see what the Gnostics had done within the true church. Now Simon Magus, I'm mentioning him 
because uh, he was the leader of all of that. Simon Magus had plenty of Babylonian and Persian material to work with in Samaria because Simon Magus was the uh, successor of the Babylonian mystery religion. That Babylonian mystery religion was basically preserved, you know, uh, many of that in Syria, and many of that material was preserved, you know, with, with, with Persian tradition. So there was plenty of Babylonian Persian material to work with, you know. So it's not strange, brethren, for Babylonian mysteries to be in Syria and Samaria, because the Samaritans were a hybrid race originally from Babylon and Persia. And it's written in the Bible, in 2 Kings chapter 17 and in the book of Ezra chapter 4. You see, the Babylonian customs and religions were imported from Babylon and Syria to the capital of the world at that time, Rome. And in fact, Babylon had funneled much of its racial stock and also its religious ideas to Syria and later to Rome. Now that's important because that very church that accepted all the Babylonian customs and religions, that is the leader of the ecumenism today, that same church is celebrating midnight mass, which has nothing to do with Christianity, has nothing to do with Christ in a few hours. And all of its once Protestant daughters, now all, the, all of them together will now be singing this night. You'd be surprised, the first time I watched the midnight mass uh, in Vatican, all of a sudden I heard a very familiar tune but it was they were singing in Latin of course the tune goes dun, 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 dun. I thought why is this familiar now because I've got some connections in the Adventist church and and, 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 and I've been over the time I've been uh, some of my close relatives became Adventists anyway I thought wait a second isn't this what the Adventists sing? Yes, they do, of course. The Adventists in the 19th century didn't didn't keep Christmas, by the way. But now, as we're going towards the end, uh, they have just watered down much of their doctrines, and they've just now, they're now keeping Christmas, you know. And Easter and the rest of the rest of so-called Christian holidays. So uh, they sing that quite night. And I thought, since they're basically the Protestant Sabbath keepers, they probably they probably borrowed that from from Vatican. I wouldn't think that Vatican would borrow anything from the Protestant world. So it seems, dear brethren, that all these Protestant churches that are all around you have borrowed quite nice from Vatican. <laughs> they'll be all singing in a few hours. They'll be all singing in unison that quite night to celebrate supposedly the birth of Jesus Christ. But you see. All of that, all of those customs stem from the Babylonian religion, mystery religion, brethren. And uh, Gnosticism is therefore pre-Christian as to its preparation, and Simon Magus is its foundation. Now you may wonder also, why Gnosticism? Why, you know, for, what, for what purpose did Satan devise Gnosticism? <laughs> oh well, I guess you would know the answer. Remember, brethren, that what what Satan cannot destroy, he must confuse or capture, you know. He must do one of that. He must confuse. If he can if he can enter confusion among the people, even better. If he cannot destroy them, he'll confuse them. So Gnosticism intended to become a universal religion. And it is today. The word Catholicus means universal. And evidence is so abundant that even though Gnosticism had a syncretistic background, so adopting various uh, elements from various religion, religions and therefore creating a hybrid religion, regardless of their background, nevertheless, it was a religion of its own. And Gnosticism was an intentional devi deviation from the truth, from orthodoxy. In Neander's Church History, Volume 2, page 30, it says, When these Gnostics, with their system already made, looked into the New Testament, they could easily find it very new religion all there, since they only sought for points to which they might attach it. And even to this day, there is one, I've, see, I've seen it 
there is a work which says uh, that the Apostle Paul and his writings are all Gnostics that reach for Gnosticism and stuff. There is a book like that. I've seen it in Serbian. I'm, I'm presu- I presume you have plenty of that in English language because the English books production is quite, the level of that production is quite amazing. Anyway, in Adolf Harnack, History of Dogma, page 60, Harnack says that Gnostics undertook to set forth Christianity as the absolute religion and they therefore placed it in opposition to the other religions, to that of the Old Testament as well, not alone to Judaism, but the absolute religion which they coupled with Christ was to them essentially identical with the results of the philosophy of religion for which they had now found the basis in a revelation. They were accordingly a class of Christians who essayed through a sharp onset to conquer Christianity for Hellenic culture, for Hellenic culture, for Christianity. Hellenic culture meaning Greek culture anyway. The late Gnosticism is in fact, as Chief Chiefrit has well expressed, the spirit of Asiatic antiquity seeking to assert its empire over the soul of man by insinuating itself into the Christian church. This is from the the Gnostic Center, there remains, page 9, author Charles William King. So Gnosticism, brethren, if you wonder why God allowed, why, why Satan went to the length to prepare Gnosticism, well, it's for the two goals. To pervert, confound, and confuse the true church, if possible, and to bring more error into the Catholic Church at a later date, just as we are seeing today. Now, you know, armed with this their deliberate perversions of the of Old Testament scripture, fully intending to pervert Christianity according to Satan's plan, they basically, the Gnostics, swarmed into the church, brethren. And it seems that perhaps it's not only something that happened in the first century, they can always warm into the church as well. Sometimes I was very amazed when I heard some Heretical ideas that would just pop up into our midst. People with all kinds of heretical ideas about aliens, uh, reptiles, and I don't know whatever, whatever else. You know, it's it, it, it's just uh, oh yes, the, the Nephilim and stuff like that. It's all you see. People like that can warm into the church. Sometimes they try to subvert the the, the truth. In the case of this Diotrephes in Third John, he was obviously in some kind of power, because otherwise he would not be able to exercise that power and 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 uh, remove people from the church unless he was having that some kind of pastoral power. Anyway, we don't see what kind of power because it's never it's nowhere stated that he was was he a deacon was he a uh, a minister, an evangelist, or whatever, it simply doesn't doesn't tell us. So we are just left to our own devices to think about it. The Creator. And In any case, someday. sorry, uh, I've got <laughs> some of my Christmas myths for today <laughs> interfering. Anyway, uh, interfering. So uh, because today. During the day, I've made like four short radio programs, Christmas myths in four parts. Uh, I managed to upload it on my YouTube channel, so you can find it right there. You can share it with others as well. It's what we were able to read recently from Dr. Bob Thiel's update on Christmas myths anyway. We know those myths anyhow, but they're there. I thought they'll be very valuable to kind of uh, uh, announce them in a radio format and uh, of course with the uh, with the sources that support all of those myths you know the, the trees the carols the and everything else besides all the from from before I've got about three programs on my youtube channel like you just you know you just go there and search for Christmas you'll find I've got about three messages already uh, that I have on that very festivity, I can't call it holiday because it's not. So to pervert, confound, confuse the true church, that was 
the goals that Gnosticism had, and Christmas being part of Gnostic teachings as well. These Gnostics, various Gnostics, for the most part, had no intention of separating from the rest of the Church and establishing distinct communities of their own, tells us Neander's Church History, Volume 2, page 33. They were for uniting with the ordinary congregations and establishing in connection with them a kind of theosophic school of Christian mysteries. That's what we are now about. And now that's why the... No wonder, because the Babylonian mystery religion is there. One other important fact about Gnosticism, also must not be overlooked, but in the German scholars, Lysippus, in his uh, book written in 1860, book entitled Gnosticism, Its Essence, Origin and Development, he shows the development of Gnosticism is similar to a curve which began only slightly off from the truth diverse far out, far out, and finally returned closely to the Catholic Church. And finally, under the Marcionites, the Gnostic speculation approximates very nearly that of the more liberal Catholic teachers. This is the comment from McClintock's and Strong's concord, uh, sorry, McClintock's and Strong's concordance, but also from the Dictionary of Christian Biography, volume 2, page 682. So with this background, you can now just have idea. Zeus feeds me. That's what Diotrephus means anyway. With this kind of idea now, you can better have a, a clue of what kind of a character, what kind of a type was this Diotrephus anyway. Uh, the one who spoke pratic words against the, against the apostles and the of course, the apostle, the apostle John, in particular. Now let's pay attention to him. Third John, brother, that's the the shortest book, the shortest book in the Bible, one of the shortest books actually. And as usually, even though it's very short, it contains a very powerful message and warning for us. And that's not the case only for the. Uh, for, uh, uh, you know, it's, that's not the case only for, for Third John. That's the case for all these short books that we have in the Bible. So, uh, one of those short books, indeed, is Third John. But it's a powerful message for us today, brethren. Because it was written for us in the New Testament. It was written in the late 90s AD, because John was the last living apostle. Uh... He addresses his letters to the elect lady and to Gaius, which, uh, you know, we call Second John and Third John contain a relevant warning for us. You see, the elder, he says, that, for example, in Second John, to the elect lady and her children whom I love in truth, and not only I, but also all those who have known the truth, because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Grace, mercy, and peace be with you, will be with you, from God the Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ, the Son of the Father, in truth and love. Typical John, you might say. Now, again, as I mentioned to the late 1st century AD, was a time of doctrinal departure from the truth. Well, I think it says, uh, was it in Second, Second John, in Second Timothy, chapter 4, of 1 Timothy chapter 4, I have to now check it out, it speaks that in the last days, there will be people, brethren, who will depart from the sound doctrine, and even teach the doctrines of demons. Uh, we've got several of those, several such uh, uh, warnings in the Bible. In 2 Timothy uh, chapter 4, I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, writes the, the Apostle Paul, who will judge the living and the dead at his departing, at his appearing, and his kingdom. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort, with all suf long suffering and teaching. Oh, here it is. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but according to their own desires, notice, according to their own desires, because they have itching ears, they'll heap up for themselves teachers. So for themselves, they'll heap it up teachers and so on, 
and they will turn their ears away from the truth and be turned aside to fables. But you be watchful in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. So he did fulfill, Timothy fulfilled his ministry. Some didn't, many didn't, brethren. Many didn't. And in First Timothy chapter 4 verse 1, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times some will depart from the truth, giving heed to deceiving spirits and doctrines of demons, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from foods which God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good, and nothing is to be refused if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Of course, he is not advocating consumption of unclean meat. He just, we know what it is, you know. Uh, what is, as he says, made for food, so we receive that with thanksgiving. But, you know, you have this, nowadays you have all of these, not only vegetarians, all these, suddenly you have this new fad of vegans, or vegans, anyway, who don't eat anything that is of animal origin. And they don't want to eat, you know, honey, they wouldn't drink milk, they wouldn't eat eggs, and anyway. So, you might say those are the doctrines that are not in the Bible. You might say they are the doctrines of demons. In a sense, yes. And sadly, many of these ecological movements, I've noticed, and, uh, uh, you know, healthy living movements, uh, there are various of these false preachers, I might say, who just inject their own uh, ideas and tell people, supposedly, that it's not healthy to drink milk, it's not healthy to do this, that, and the other, and so on. So they're just having the doctrines of demons because God never forbade consumption of honey, eggs, and milk. On the contrary, the land where the Israelites were going was the land flowing with milk and honey. Anyway, by the time of the first century, of the end of the first century, there was a massive doctrinal apostasy, a massive doctrinal departure from the truth, and many brethren, but I would even speculate most, many if not most had already apostatized and given up the faith once delivered for a false counterfeit Christianity. The one that tonight celebrates the supposed birth of the Messiah. Now John lived into, you know, he lived on into this degenerate period and he was grateful for the few who were still holding steadfast against the liberal tide of the day. And he warned the faithful to keep on serving the brethren and to be on guard against selfish apostates who loved to lord it over their brethren, even casting them out of the church. The so-called church father Eusebius says that John, after the death of Emperor Domitian in AD 95, returned from his exile on the Isle of Patmos to Ephesus, and then he went on evangelical tours into Gentile regions, visiting the churches of Asia, ordaining bishops and elders. You see Second John, let's read chapter, uh, let's read not chapter, but uh, verse 12. Second John 12. Having many things to write to you, I did not wish to do so with paper and ink, but I hope to come to you and speak face to face, that our joy may be full. The children of your elect sister greet you. Amen. So, uh, you see, he was visiting, strengthening the, 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 the faithful, those few faithful, strengthening them and encouraging them to endure to the end. Uh, in Third John chapter, uh, chapter 1, verse 10, it says, Therefore, if I come, I'll call to mind his deeds, that's this Diotrephus, which he does, prating against us with malicious words. And not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those who wish to put in them out of the out of the church. And in uh, verse fourteen, but I hope to uh, to see you shortly, and we shall speak face to face. Peace to you, our friends. Greet you. Greet the friends by 
name. So we see from those two verses that John had his own visitation trips, and thus it appears that these letters are the last written portions of the Holy Scriptures because they're living letters of the you know of the hard times of spiritual depression, which you know people could have experienced like spiritual depression like I and others have experienced in the 90s of the last century and which we may still experience ahead of us particularly in the time shortly before the flight to the place of safety of which better I have abundantly warned you about now second John his second epistle address is addressed to the elect lady and her children with John were the children of thy elect sister in verse 13 as we've just we have just seen and commentaries mention that lady may refer to a church or be a proper name of a woman but we know it's a church the Greek Kiriako Kuria Kiria is equivalent to the Hebrew of Martha so Kiriako Kyrios Kiriakos means belonging to the God and is the source of uh, kurios, the word for, or kurios, the word for church in Greek. Now, Third John is addressed to Gaius, who might have been, you know, a Gaius of Macedonia, who was a traveling companion of Paul, as I mentioned the last uh, last Sabbath. Or it could be, uh, uh, you know, it could be somebody else who is mentioning in biblical history. Then I mentioned last time Demetrius, who was a faithful believer. He's mentioned in Third John chapter 11, uh, verse eleven, beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does evil, not has not seen God. Demetrius has a good testimony from all and from the truth itself and we also bear witness and you know that our testimony is true. So, uh, we have a person being very highly commended anyway. So, we don't know who which guys it would be that John is addressing in his letter, but regardless, brethren, regardless, this guy is commended for his faithfulness anyway. Now, another faithful believer is Demetrius, of course, what he mentioned. And you see, in that time of spiritual decay, the elect lady and her sister, their children, Gaius and Demetrius, were among the few who had not followed false doctrine. Now, John also knew that his life was now drawing to an end. You see, he had faithfully taken care of Mary and uh, the mother of Jesus Christ anyway, and later on anyhow. He has been faithfully serving the brethren. He returned to Ephesus and he was involved in, so to speak, encouraging, showing up the faith of the faithful few, who remained steadfast in the truth. And time and time again, John emphasizes again the importance of doctrinal truth, brethren, because at that time many have deserted the doctrinal truth. In his second letter, he rejoiced to know of even a few who are faithful, you know, faithful to the truth, because of the truth which abides in us and will be with us forever. Now, John is saying nothing can take the truth from us because of persecute, because, you know, it, it, it is in us by spirit of the Savior, the Messiah. Now, the Emperor Domitian, who orchestrated persecution against the Christians, so the Emperor, not the Emperor Domitian's persecution, not apostasy by many, not false brethren following false false doctrines, nothing can take that truth from us. Nothing can take the crown of life from us. Of course that we must follow the eternal commandment, follow the way of love. What is that way, brethren? Well, it's the Messiah. Many then and many, many today, such as the New 
age movement, which I mentioned already, many to say that Jesus was just a good man, but not God, not divine, not our Master and Lord. Well, this is the spirit of Antichrist, says the Apostle, the Apostle John. The doctrinal truth that the Apostle wanted, you know, is what the Apostle wanted to hammer home before he died. He says, Second John verse 9, And who runs ahead instead of follows behind and does not continue in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Son and the Father. So there were indeed people who were placing themselves ahead of God. Or people who are a God unto themselves. They just don't need Jesus Christ to return to judge the brethren because they judge the brethren themselves. This is the primary warning John gives in both his second and his third letters. Now those who depart from the doctrine, brethren, and attempt to come into your house, you are not to receive them, not even buy them God's speed, Second John chapter, uh, verse 10 through 11. The third John continues John's final admonition for us to follow the way of love and truth. He basically, you know, wishes guys would be physically healthy and he was, as he was spiritually healthy. So it sounds like guys like John was an old warrior in the faith and maybe was, uh, you know, weary from all these spiritual battles. In any case, Realizing the context and time when G. John wrote this, Brendan, it's utterly amazing to note his boundless op optimism, his vigor for the work of God in the Almighty's cause. Now there were plenty, there was plenty of, re plenty of reason for gloom and doom, you know, because Brendan, the false doctrine was flying around all over the place, false teachers everywhere, persecution of the true believers. Well, Perhaps John knew that these two letters would be his last recorded record. No wonder. So he doesn't hammer home the importance of keeping the Sabbath, the holidays, tithing, etc. We know that, you know, because we know that he kept it because we have the uh, testimony of his disciple Polycarp, who was Bishop of Smyrna. But John gets right to the heart of the matter and gives a we might say a valedictory message for all time. Now the important thing that he stresses in both of these second and third epistles is service to others. Put others first. Serve the brethren. Love the brethren. Hold on to doctrinal truths, you know. And don't knuckle under and become like the, like the false brethren who twist the truth and who may even put you out of the church. Now there is this another group associated with the truth. John doesn't lambast them, but he cannot ignore them. So they are, they are, they are, these are they who have lost the things God, uh, John and others worked for to build in their lives. Second John and verse eight. Look to yourselves that we do not lose those things we worked for, whether we may receive a, a full reward. So they are deceivers who do not believe in the Godhood of, of Christ and have not stayed in the doctrine of Christ, verse 7 says, and verse 9, for many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as, a coming, in the, as coming in the flesh. This is a deceiver and an antichrist. For many deceivers have gone into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. Now this is a deceiver and an antichrist. For many deceivers have gone out into the world who do not confess Jesus Christ as coming in the flesh. Anyhow, brethren, those are the tenets of Gnosticism that Paul is fighting with. They have departed from the true doctrines. They refuse to assist faithful travel, traveling, evangelizing brethren who are keeping the truth alive. And when we read, you know, about the many cases in the New Testament church 
of false teachers and false brethren, it's easy to get uh, again to a wrong impression that these false prophets had never, uh, that these false prophets already had thrown everything out and hell had gone back to the world. No, 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 no. The apostate church, later termed ca- uh, a Catholic or universal, or universal, claimed to be Christian. It had a form of godliness, but they in practice denied the power of that godliness. In John's day, the, uh, this group prevailed against the, chur- against the church and was dominant. So they were in control of most of the public assemblies of brethren. One assembly near Gaius was led by a man named Diotrephes, whose name means nourished by Zeus. We know nothing, you know, more of Diotrephes, uh, nothing more is known anyway, than John's reproof of him in verse 9 and 10 of 3 John. 3 John 9 and 10. Let's, let's see it. 3 John 9. Whoever trespasses and does, uh, no, 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 sorry. Uh, it'll be third John verse nine. I wrote to the church, but Diotrephes, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. That's verse nine, verse ten. Therefore, if I come, I'll call to mind his deeds, which he does, prating against us with malicious words. And, not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren and forbids those uh, who wish to putting them out of the church. So it's obvious that Diotrephes was one who loves to be first, as it says in verse 9. The Jameson Fawcett and Brown commentary says he was a leading man who evidently occupied a high place in the church where Gaius was. Now he was, Diotrephus had a domineering personality, his superior knowledge and his ability to, 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 to you know, know the, he, he had ability no doubt to, to lead people to look up to him and he relished in, in being top dog. Now that's quite a contrast, of course, to the spirit of humility which John expresses all the time. Rather than appealing to who he was, John appealed to the love of Jesus. Because John, John could have written, well, follow me because if I was there, I knew Jesus Christ personally. I was his favorite disciple. Instead, John told the brethren, love and serve one another. Now, Diotrephus also held first place, as we read, in the local church. This may be also an indication that he was the first one to receive God's truth in the in the area. You know, he may have been instrumental in bringing others he dared come into the church, brethren, but this role, the role of leadership, went to his head. He did not have the character to lead. Instead, he became authoritarian, ruling over the brethren with a with an iron fist, iron hand. Now, they, they were two objects to the out of his attack. The first is the Apostle John, and secondly, the other true brethren who, who received and support, uh, they received and supported traveling brethren, you see. Now, what was the problem of this man? whose name was nourished by Zeus. Well, from 60 to 135 AD, that was a period of intense anti-Jewish sentiment. Roman literature, law, condemned Jews, and especially their Sabbath keeping. Roman armies crushed Jerusalem and destroyed the temple about 70 AD. A second Jewish revolt led by Bar Kokhba was crushed by the Romans. And Emperor Hadrian, outlawed Judaism and Sabbath keeping under punishment of death. Professing Christians in order to save their skins, they bent with the time and became anti-Jewish, eventually exciting, uh, 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 eventually uh, 
bringing that to the point when when the Passover was exchanged for Easter and Sabbath for Sunday. Now, already mentioned in the end, there are things that the brethren mentioned in Third John were actually Jews by birth, since it was said to their to their phrase that they took no financial support from Gentiles and uh, as some others, you know, abused the minister's right to support. In Second Corinthians chapter 7, verse 7 and 8, Paul asked, Did I commit sin in humbling myself that you might be expel- exalted because I preached the gospel of God to you for free? I robbed other churches, taking wages from them to minister to you. And when I was present with you, uh, and uh, verse nine, and when I was present with you and in need, I was a, I was a burden to no one, for what I lacked, the brethren who came from Macedonia supplied. And in everything, I keep myself. From being burdensome to you, also so I will keep myself. Now, Diotrephes may have been the head of an anti-Jewish party in the church. And, you know, that would explain why he was not accepting the, uh, well, the Jewish Christian evangelical travelers and putting, uh, putting them out of the church and putting out of the church those who did who did so those who did accept the uh, uh, evangelical Christian travelers Diotrephus appears to be a forerunner brethren of two infamous heretics Ignatius Bishop of Antioch who died in 110 AD insisted that the church must be ruled by bishops he taught that no Eucharist or baptism was possible without the bishop, and wherever the bishop is, there let the people be, for there is the Catholic Church. The church later, or bishop, said Ignatius, presides in the place of God. Anyway, we have some commentaries. JFEB commentary says Diotrephes was a forerunner of Marcion, Marcion who died around 160 AD, and that he was a heretic who rejected the Apostle John. Now, son of the Bishop of Sinope, Marcion, he traveled to the province of Asia where he met faithful Polycarp, a disciple of John, who said that Marcion was the firstborn of Satan. Now, later, Marcion started his own sect in Rome. He maintained that the true church was wrong in rejecting the Old Testament and regarding Jesus as Messiah. He required baptism and celibacy. He was enforcing a rigorous asceticism as a condition for salvation, this Marcion. He said that Paul alone had understood Jesus and the Gospels and that the Jewish disciples, such as John, had carried too much Judaism into the New Testament. So John Polycarp and, and, and Polycarp's disciple Polycrats did not listen to Diotrephus, Ignatius, Marcion and other heretics who were authoritarian, anti-Old Testament and anti-Jewish. You see, the faithful few brethren continued to keep the annual Passover on the 14th of Abib each year as given by our Savior. Now, finally, John tells us to imitate good, not evil, he gives the example of Demetrius, whom everyone says had done, has done well. Now, when the, even the truth itself testifies of him, as well as John himself. So, we should not imitate wicked, harsh, judgmental people such as Diotrephus. Instead, be merciful, loving, and kind. Well, can we be like Demetrius? Well, second and third epistles of John, they end with similar statements. You see, John had many more things to say indeed, 
but he felt it not best to write them down. He would speak personally to the elect lady and Gaius upon when he, visit, he visited them. And why didn't John write these things down, so you may wonder? Well, better perhaps, as some have speculated, it would not reveal more details than John wanted about the origins and personalities behind the development apostasy in the church. Now, we don't know the location of the Lady and Gaius, but it must have been not far from Ephesus where John lived. Anyway, we had better listen to what John wrote, because uh, which it has been preserved for us today. Indeed, he had received the revelation of Jesus Christ, and he is the one who wrote down the revelation when Christ revealed it to him. John was still writing letters, visiting the brethren, working to encourage the brethren to hold fast, to love and to serve one another in an apostolic era, warning them that he that go, does good is God, is of God, he who does, but he that does evil has not seen God. And his work, we might say, is unfinished, because third John doesn't end with the usual Amen, and that means that there's things unwritten. In any case, let's read about that. Let's read about that. Uh, Diotrephes. Let's pick it up in verse 9. No, let's go to verse... Verse 5. Beloved... You do faithfully whatever you do for the brethren and for strangers who have borne witness of your love before the church if you send them forward on their journey in a manner worthy of God you will do good. Why? Well because they want they, they went forth for his name's sake, taking nothing from the Gentiles. We therefore ought to receive such, such brethren, that we may become followers, uh, fellow workers for the truth. I wrote to the church, says John, but uh, Diotrephes, nourished by Zeus, who loves to have the preeminence among them, does not receive us. Therefore, if I come, I'll, I'll call to mind his deeds, which he does, Pressing against us with malicious words. And not content with that, he himself does not receive the brethren, and therefore, uh, and the, sorry, the brethren, and forbids those who wish to putting them out of the church. So he wished those who wants to receive those traveling evangelists, he, he was putting them out of the church. He was actively doing that, brethren. Actively doing that. You see, you might say an active falling away from the truth. And John says, Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. He who does good is of God, but he who does not, he who does evil has not seen has not seen God, has not understood God, has not, has not got to know God, and has not really understood the uh, the character of God, we might say that way. Now, we know, brethren, that church leaders do not preside in the place of God. Uh, John has described now a group of, you know, spiritual diseases, and he also describes prescribes remedy, but for some of, but uh, for some the medicine is just too bitter to take. <laughs> but ch uh, church leaders, again, do not preside over in the place of God. They are not first place in the church; they are last place. They are tireless servants of all. True brethren have, you know, calluses on their hands from serving God's people, on their feet from traveling to visit God's people on their tongues from discussing spiritual matters and principles, and on their knees from prayer. Their Bibles are worn and marked. They are doing, Matthew twenty four forty six. 46, Blessed is that servant 
whom his master, when he comes, will find so doing. Now, those who have the diatrophies, this diatrophy is kind of complex, those people love to be first. They love to rule over their brethren, at the same time, not lifting a finger to help spread the good news of the kingdom to others, you know. John's message of love among the brethren is foreign to them. If they were 80 or 30 years old, you wouldn't catch them writing spiritual letters, visiting the brethren and optimistically encouraging others to keep the doctrines delivered by Jesus, keeping the annual Passover on the 14th and uh, all the other commandments of God. Victims of the dreaded diatrophies symptoms or that of his complex disease, are not anything except making themselves look good. They spend plenty of time to make themselves look look good. Now, me is always at the bottom of sin. One little word, me, it may spell drink, lust, pride, covetousness, self-will, but it is from It is from me. Now, brethren, lest we miss a major point, let us also be reminded that people like Diotrephes and what they had done to the original church were prophesied in the Bible. And yes, sometimes we don't want to think about all the prophecies, but that which is prophesied has to be fulfilled because God is not a liar. So the main point is that people like Diotrephes and what they had done to the original church was indeed were prophesied in the Bible. People who were not happy with the simplicity of the truth and they went, they ventured, they ventured to invent their, their own ideas. Even today, even today in the churches of God, Sometimes you see people inventing their old ideas, etc., etc. Now notice, Mosheim, the church historian, he admits that Christian churches had scarcely been organized when mess rose up, who, not being contented, contented with the simplicity and purity of that religion, which the apostles taught, attempted innovations and fashion religion according to their own liking. Now these were conspirators, men masquerading as God's ministers, but who were actually wolves in sheep's clothing. Now since the new inventions and ideas of these clever men required proof not to be found in the writings of the apostles, recourse was uh, recourse was uh, record had uh, to uh, was had to falsehood and impositions. When asked where they learned what they so confidently taught, some produced fictitious books under the names of Abraham, Zoroaster, and Christ, or his apostles. Sometimes some pretended to have derived their principles from a secret doctrine taught by God. Now, this church had different leaders, different traditions, different doctrines, and uh, also a wildly different spirit. Was this the true church gone wrong? Or was the another a direct and false church that was being founded by men who were uh, a different uh, and saint, supposedly saint, but actually it was a different and false church that 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 was going was being founded by men who were tools in Satan the devil. Obviously, this was not God's church anymore. Now, a telltale clue is the complete absence of historical connection links. A great yawning nap, you know, an unbridge, unbridgeable chasm separated by the apostolic church Christ founded from the known beginning of today's professing Christian churches. 
as the historian Edward Gibbon, in his it is decline and fall of the Roman Empire, chapter fifteen, he said candidly says the scanty material of ecclesiastical history seldom enable us to dispel the cloud that hangs over the head over the first age of the of the, of the church. Now, in the story of the Christian Church by Jesse Lehman Halbert, this page is called uh, just after the Axis page after Axis called the Age of Shadows. And he continues, he says, of the period in the, in the church history is the one about which we know the least for 50 years. Oh, all right. He's saying that this is the, this is the context of the story, it's something that we least know and understand because we don't know really what, uh, we don't know what office this, uh, this nourished by Zeus occupied anyway. And so, uh, Anyhow, uh, we don't know, and uh, we don't know what position he might have had. But anyway, uh, 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 this growing gap separates the Apostolic Church, Church Jesus founded from the, for the from the known beginning of today's professing Christian ministers. Now, in. Uh, have I read, have I read Gibbon, Decline and Fall of the Roman Empire? I have. But we see, brethren, was this really the same church that Jesus found? Obviously it was not. The true church of God had faded from view and another church was on stage. Because scarcely 20 years after the crucifixion of Christ, of Jesus, the, uh, the apostle Paul in one of his First inspired letters cautioned Christians not to be deceived by false preaching or by false letters supporting purportedly purporting to be from the apostles. Here it writes in Second Thessalonians chapter two verse three Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day, referring to the time of God's intervention in human affairs, when Jesus Christ will return to rule the nations. For that day shall not come, except there come first a falling away. So the wholesale departure of professing Christians from the truth was prophesied as something which had to happen before Jesus Christ could return. Brethren, how did it happen? Well, I mentioned all the Acts chapter eight. After Simon Magus had been dunked, and yet. In a most unconverted and Christian attitude, he tried to uh, uh, remain very selfish. This Simon Magus. So, according with his own selfish aims, the Apostle Peter told him plainly in uh, chapter twenty, in chapter eight, verse twenty-one. He says. Thou has not, thou has not, has neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. So Peter, by the Holy Spirit of God in him, had read Simon's mind. But why did he mention a lot? You know, a lot, the means by which Jesus Christ had designed Matthias to the vacant place of Judas. In Acts chapter 1 verse 26. Because what Simon was attempting to buy, brethren, was <laughs> the apostleship there in the, in the early church and something obviously much more. Because Simon was already chief religious leader in Samaria in the book of Acts chapter 9. So let's go to the book of Acts and let, and let's check it in chapter 9 so that nobody can see that we are making something up, you see. And the patriarchs, becoming envious, sold Joseph into Egypt. And now we are looking for chapter 8, verse 9. Sorry, chapter 8, verse 9, exactly. But there was a certain man called Simon, who previously practiced sorcery in the city, 
and astonished the people of Samaria, claiming that he uh, was something great. He was something great. Just like we see this, uh, that this, uh, from the third John, the Iotrephus, believed that he was something obviously great, and he was entitled to the authority to receive whom he wishes and remove whom he wants. So, Simon was already the leader of Samaria, great. And, uh, however, church had a power, and its message, the wonderful message was of coming kingdom of God and prosperity, had an appeal that his church religion lacked, you see. People wanted that. What a springboard for Simon. He reasoned, I should gain truly universal power and authority through religion. Now, of course, his motives were all wrong, and when he failed to buy the power of the Holy Spirit, he neither repented nor changed his name. Instead, he continued to claim to be a Christian and a leader of Christians, and in fact, he, at all of that, he claimed to be he claimed to be an apostle. And thus, Simon, what he did was, brethren, he began to build his church. Now, the Catholic historian of the fourth century, Eusebius, states unequivocally. We should understood, he says, Eusebius, we should understood to take the lead in every heresy. From, uh, you know, from whom also down to the present time, those that followed him still affected the modest philosophy of the Christians. It's Eusebius Ecclesiastical History Book 2, Chapter 13. Others taking their cue from him, other joined him as his subordinates, meaning uh, subordinates of Simon Magus, or set out independently to gain a following for themselves as he bid, which of course worked out, and that's how we have this root of this modern Babylonianism, of this modern spiritual confusion, brethren. Now, Though nearly all the writings of the church in the years after 70 AD have perished, yet prophecy remains. Paul, the teacher of the Gentiles, had explained how the apostasy could spread, you see. Because Paul gathered the the elders, the ministers of the church in Ephesus, to deliver them a final message concerning their responsibility over the local congregations. For said Paul, I know this. Acts 20, verse 29. I know this, that after my departure shall grievous wolves enter in among you, not sparing the flock. And also of your own selves shall men arise, speaking perverse things. You may really wonder why, well, why, well, to draw away disciples after them. This is all recorded in Acts chapter 20, verse 29 through 38. There were those who were be speaking, who would be speaking perverse things to gain a personal following for themselves, to start new denominations. Now, these two verses, uh, do, we, do we, do we catch the full significance of these two verses? You see, the elders of minister were especially assembled because immediately after Paul would leave Ephesus, not centuries later, but immediately after he departs, there would come within the local church congregations false ministers, wolves in sheep's clothing, to make a prey of Christians. And even from these elders ordained by Paul, himself some would pervert the doctrine of, of, of Jesus to secure a following of Christians themselves. Now, did it all happen, brethren? Yes. Yes, it did, because the church was, contrary to what many people do not understand, the church was subverted from within. And all Asia, the province in which Ephesus was located, it was basically, brethren, all Asia, it was turned away from Paul. In Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, 
2 Timothy 1, 15. This you know, that all these, all those in Asia have turned away from me, Paul writes, of whom are Regalus and Hermogenes. So we have the whole Asia. Have you realized that, brethren? Do you realize how massive was this departure from the truth, brethren? All those in Asia have turned away from me. All those. They did not remain faithful in face of persecution that Paul faced. And no wonder then that Paul, we find Paul instructing the evangelist Timothy in his writings... Uh, in Second Timothy chapter four, verse three and four. Second Timothy chapter four, verse three and four. He tells Timothy to reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come that they will not endure sound doctrine, but after their own lusts. So the congregations wanting to do what they please, but after their own lusts shall they heap to themselves teachers which will be, you know, elect ministers who will preach what they want to hear. Uh, and many shall turn away their ears from the truth and shall be turned unto fables. Now, no wonder, not only Paul, but also Peter warned the churches that many would be misled. That false teacher, that, that false teachers among Christians would bring in heresies, and many shall follow their pernicious way. Second Peter chapter two verse two. Many shall follow their pernicious ways, by reason of whom the way of truth shall be evil spoken of. Yes, brethren, they caused lies to be circulated about God's church and God's people. Yes, indeed, and no wonder that Jude. Apostle and brother of Jesus had to include in his letter the stern admonition that every Christian should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of God into lasciviousness, meaning permissiveness to do evil, and denying the only Lord God and only Lord Jesus Christ. And then uh, in Jude, uh, if you go, and I've just read uh, verse 3 of his epistle, now verse uh, 13, he says, These be they who separate themselves, set up divisions, you know. Those who separate themselves are those who set up divisions, which means they set up sects and denominations. Sensual, having not the spirit. So those who were divided and and tried to build for themselves, you know, following in their own churches, brethren, those are those in the first century trying to devise their sects and denominations. Since we're having not the spirit, giving grace, turning grace into of God into lasciviousness, permissiveness. You know, they turn the grace or unmerited pardon of God into a license to disobey the commandments. Now Jude also shows these preachers separating themselves and their followers from the body of Christ, the church. They formed their own churches and called them the churches of Christ. But they were no longer, if ever, real Christians anyway. The Apostle John saw the same, the same apostasy developed and, 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 and outliving all of the other apostles. He wrote nearly 40 years later as an eyewitness of these of of that uh, that happened anyway. Uh, in First John chapter four verse one, because many false prophets or preachers are gone out into the world, he warns. They profess to be Christ ministers, brethren, but they came in the name of Christ, but they were antichrists. And he continues then. Verse 5 and 6, they are of the world, therefore speak they of the world, and the world 
hears them. Indeed, we are of God. He that knows God hears us. He that is not of God hears us, hears us not. So whoever does not obey him, thereby know we the spirit of truth and the spirit of error. Now, do we grasp the meaning of, of these verses? The world believed, the many false ministers, brethren, the few listened to and believed the apostles of Christ. The world did not listen and the world did not believe the apostles. The world accepted instead the false preachers who rose up in the church. If you please notice, we can find it now in First uh, John chapter 2. Verse 18 and 19. Little children, it is the last time, and as ye have heard that Antichrist shall come, yet even now there are many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. They went out from us, in other words, they had left the church, but they were not of us. For, for if they had been of us, that is converted, they would no doubt have continued with us. But they went out that they might be made manifest that they were not all of us. In other words, there are unconverted men, brethren. And some people like that manage to creep into the church of God from time to time. And sadly, they spread their own heresies, you know, and trying to, all, trying to make other people their disciples anyway. And you wonder why there are so many denominations today? Well, because they went out of us to be manifest so that they're not of us. First John chapter 2 verse 18 and 19. And of the same condition, John writes in his second epistle, verse 7 and verse 9. For many deceivers are entering into the world. Whosoever transgresses and abides not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. Well, see, those false teachers who left the church, the true church, they professed to know God, they pretended to obey God, but in their words, brethren, they denied Him, being, as it says in Titus 1.16, being abominable and disobedient and unto every good work reprobate. They, you see, they professed Christ and the Father, but they rejected the authority of God and His law. They were disobedient. They acknowledged that Jesus Christ, Jesus was the Christ. They came in His name, professing to be the ministers of Christ, but they rejected His message. They rejected His message, and as a result, true Christians were forced out from those various congregations. In uh, John chapter 60, verse 2, uh, we have that, you know, long ago Jesus had warned that the time will come when any true followers of his would be put out of religious congregations, mostly composed of deceived people. Of deceived people. Does that shock you? Well, let's read it in the Bible itself, brethren. I know this often when we talk about apostasy, unfaithfulness and stuff. We always think, well, it's somewhere outside, it's somewhat, uh, somewhere out there. But the first century has showed us that, no, there were many who crept in. The, the, the Jude says that. There might be people who will just, you know, attempt, indeed, pretend, masquerade themselves as Christians, but attempt to enter for various purposes, you know, to make themselves look good, uh, to secure their own advancement in church ranks, uh, to cause division, to take away and uh, with them certain disciples, etc., etc. But in uh, John 60, verse 2, they'll put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. But in John's day, this occurred whenever the false ministers were able to influence the majority in a local church. They simply took over and began to expel any remaining true Christians. And in the letter of the Apostle John to Gaius, we read, I wrote unto the church, 
This is third John verse nine and ten that the Otrephis who loves to have preeminence among us receives us not, and he forbids them that would and causes them cast them out of the church. Well the true Christians who alone comprise the true church were being put out of the visible organized congregations. They were scattered ones of whom John said, Therefore the world knows us not, because it knew him not. These words of Jesus Christ are actually first John chapter three and verse one. But did that not mean the scattered individuals were not part of the church. They only were the church, brethren, they were the only church because they were joined to Christ through the Holy Spirit. Those who drove them out because became part of the false church, the church of the God of this world, they became what is termed in Revelation, the synagogue of Satan. And that's exactly what happened in the first century. That's exactly why we find at the end of the first century all of a sudden the, 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 the curtain drops. In the next century, the second century, the curtain is open and we find once church that was commandment keeping and uh, we find that church now being something totally different, having totally different beliefs, different ways of doing things different, different practice anyway. But people like Diotrephus from time to time, brethren, find their way into the church and try to make havoc in the church. And they are always bothered by those who want to be faithful to God. You know, brethren, there are various records how there will be those false teachers who just creep in and they just they would try, right, like to bribe other church members uh, so the church members would keep quiet about their misdeeds and whatever or they would just creep in and try to draw other members to, into the same kind of uh, activities lawless activities with them or uh, Whatever other purpose they have, they always found that they could warm themselves into the church. The Gnostics had a, an outstanding success in doing that in the first century. And of course, they succeeded to expel the true followers of Christ out of the visible organized congregations. Well, this was the Diotrephus, the one that was prating, speaking prating words against the Apostle John the one who opposed the apostolic authority, the one who was so audacious that he became, he began to, at one point, expel people from the church, people who were just supporting the true evangelists coming through their town and uh, people who supported the work, the work of God indeed. And again, later in the Bible, we don't find any records of the, of the evangelist Timothy, whom the Apostle Paul exhorted to uh, resist those heretics and remain steadfast. Well, obviously, he didn't manage to resist them. Uh, they probably overpowered him by number and who knows what else and kick, kicked him out, expelled him out of the church. Well, it is important to know all these things, brethren, because Gnosticism is still present and Gnosticism is the teaching the doctrine, the philosophy that subverted God's church from within. The father of Gnosticism is Simon Magus, and we certainly have, indeed, some historical data we should know, because it's part of the history of God. Throughout the, God's, God, throughout the history of God's church, it's part of the history of God's people. Throughout the history of God's people, there were occasionally various... Uh, Diotrephes, Diotrephes is those <laughs> nourished by Zeus. Zeus is the uh, supreme deity of the Greeks. So there were those various Diotrephes, you know, who would exercise this wrong power, misuse power, manipulate with their position, 
and have done some damage to the people of God. So, keep in mind, brethren, to keep away from these symptoms or 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 or, or this diagnosis called diotrephis, and uh, pray to God that we all remain humble and that we all remain faithful and that we endure to the end, to the end of this age, so that we can know that nobody and no diotrephis could take away our crown.